So hi, morning everyone. Yeah, so first about the name is like uh, into autonomous driving and of course we'll talk about uh, all the techniques and tools which we can use. And uh, I, I gave this kind of a name to car, the autonomous car because my kid especially, whenever I used to tell him autonomous car, autonomous car, he will say it sounds like namaskar, which is like greetings in Hindi. So I just gave it like name auto namaskar and then I bought the domain. That's where the whole thing started. We go to the next slide. Uh, that's where like from where to begin. That's the first thing we have to understand because once I came to Detroit and of course it is this automotive domain, this is where I began like donkey car. And this is like a donkey car is like a platform for autonomous driving, especially for the people who don't have much background, uh, especially in the autonomous driving from where to begin. So I got all the tools. If you, I mean, this is about me, of course. I I work as a product designer for almost 80 years in Snyder, I designed a lot of electromechanical products, and then later I came here to UPenn to do my masters, uh, minor in business and major in uh, high tech product design. And that's where I, of course, learned about machine learning and a uh, bit of deep learning that time wasn't that famous. And then of course, all sorts of tools which we need for high tech product design. And uh, I generally play with technology. I mean, I have worked with uh, blockchain. I have worked with augmented reality, build off applications. It's more like as a hobby than, than anything because it's just, I just keep myself to be engaged. Yeah. And then of course, yeah. So this is where I began. Uh, this is like a competition which you can build your own RC car. You can modify it. It's very simple. It's really, really simple. You just take the RC car, tear it down, use Raspberry Pi uh, as a controller, then use Pi camera, bit of motor controller. Everything costs like less than $120. And then they have a soft stack which you can flash it. You can drive the car on a, on a, kind of a, on a loop. Then you can train the model. After that, you just kind of a, run the model. Uh, it works on behavioral cloning. Of course, we'll talk about it, but uh, that's the way I started. Uh, and this is my kid, actually, just because we just kind of uh, go around the Detroit and participate in the race. So there are kind of racing competitions around the area. You can go there. You have to train the model at the same time, and then you have to drive, and then who's the fastest and who's making less mistakes. And that's the way you kind of win the competition. This was like PangiCon last year which pretty much we are the only few cars who could kind of complete the circuit on its own. Uh, the way we can use it, like, of course, now we are just trying to get into the what it is all about. Using as a black box, of course, you just buy the hardware, configure the Raspberry Pi, collect data, build the model, train the model, try it and really have fun. And, and that's pretty much, but again, things change. Like, if you have to tweak the model parameters, that's where the complexity starts. And the question comes back like where to begin? Because if you have to tweak any any specific things, you still have no clue because it is so complex. And then let's get the basics like an approach to autonomous driving. And we will talk about first two approaches, uh, mostly vision-based, where we use a pure computer vision. Second is a deep learning approach. Of course, we won't get much time to get deeper into the deep learning approach, but we will just touch base what it is all about and then we'll see how much time, time we have in that. <laughs> The last is the robotics approach, which is like, if you know the sensor fusion team in California, they quite work on the robotics approach. Uh, and then we have different levels of autonomy. We talk about full autonomy like YMO and then level three, that's where Tesla and Mercedes, they are trying to achieve. So let's get into the vision-based approach and we will go first with the very, very basics. Because basics is like vision, so let's go to the pixel. Because pixel is the thing which we're trying to manipulate over here. And uh, so let's understand like how how the resolution works. So when we say resolution of an image is like 400 by 300, so we are talking about 400 pixels on the width side, 300 pixels on the height side, and uh, and then when we talk about color space, there are different color spaces. But here we are talking about RGB, where we have red, green, and uh, blue. So and the value lies like between 0 to 255 is 8-bit color space. And if all the RGB values like 255, then it is white. If it is 0, then it is black. Then, of course, if you have uh, R255 and 00, 00 red, green, blue, that's the way you get different channels because that's what in the end we will try to manipulate. Another approach could be we can convert everything to grayscale. 
then it becomes just one one channel which is the grayscale channel and you can have 0 to 255 as a value of intensity of the pixel 0 means black 255 is white this is kind of very basics because that's what we have to do and this is the way it is represented if you see the origin is like on the top uh, top left and it is important where the origin is because it will sort of help us to determine if it's a left lane or right lane the way the slope goes so and, and that's the way we do indexing this i use python so it starts from zero but of course you can use different languages if you need to and here we do the binary activation so when we say binary activation we are saying we are converting something by we define a threshold and if something is within that threshold we say the pixel would be zero means white if it is beyond the threshold it is black so we define those thresholding techniques to figure out or at least to identify what we need so let's try finding the lane first that's the that's the first thing and so first we will do the color selection you see the straight road straight lines and uh, we are looking for the white lane that's white lines is what we're interested and uh, we have rgb value for white is all 255 but if we convert that to the grayscale, our computation will be much less. And uh, for me, the of course, I need to pick the white lane. So I will put thresholding. So where I put like two ways, either I can put thresholding on RGB color space, like 200, 200, 200. So anything which is more than 200, then it will be a white pixel. I can say, so I can, of course, uh, program using MATLAB. And that's the way I can define that thresholding. And anything which is less than that threshold, it is black. When I put that threshold on this image, you can clearly see at least I'm able to find something which is interesting to me, which is white color lane. But of course, at this point, I don't know if they are the straight line, they could be anything, but then let's go deeper. Second thing, the reason masking. Uh, if you look in general, like pretty much we have the same area of interest, which is if you're driving at the center. so. Let's see, if I draw a triangle and if my camera is fixed at the central location and if I'm driving a straight line, you and I am driving a, on, a, on a curve, it's pretty much that's my reason of interest. And that way I can kind of declutter. So I can define my reason of interest and uh, which is the area which has white lines. Anything beyond that, I can make it black. That's so easy. Then I just kind of focus. After that, coloring the reason, this is again interest, kind of important because then we can distinguish the line of interest. And uh, here, once we find the pixels which we are looking at, which at least we need, and we can color to different colors just to distinguish from all other distraction. And now we combine everything together. So when we combine everything together, of course, we do reason masking, the color selection, then we coloring the reason, and that's where we can identify if you are interested. <coughs> but however, things changes. I mean, it's not the ideal world where we have uh, uh, the right amount of lighting and everything will be clear. If you see on the, on the left image, uh, because of the shadow, the yellow doesn't look like yellow. It looks something else. It looks a little bit whitish and, and uh, it just changes. My same model, if I put on this image, it will fall apart. It will not work. I mean, I will not be able to find the line of interest. And, uh, and another thing is like lane lines are not always the same color. Sometimes we need to know the yellow because that tells us which side we are in. And uh, in, in this case, if I use like kind of a gray scale, then my yellow line, it will go because gray scale will come as white. So we have to do something else. So now we, use, now we need to use the computer vision algorithm to go to the next level. And uh, let's talk about the computer vision, what it is. It is one of the senses because vision is kind of a senses we can see and the computer vision is using algorithm to let the computer see the world the way we see it. Uh, full depth of color, shapes, and the meaning. It is a branch of AI, <coughs> of course the machine learning. But let's just talk about what are the algorithms we have which we can use. And even now we're interested in finding the lane lines. That's, that's the whole idea. So. First, we look at the Kenny as detection, so top is not clear. And uh, Kenny as is again, uh, it, is a, it is a technique by which you can find the uh, soft differences in the 
pixel intensities. And if I draw a line <coughs> horizontally and uh, I do the intensity mapping, I can see where the where we have white lines intensity jumps yeah. pretty quickly. And and that tells us there like the sharp edges are there. So can any edges be fine edges? And that's the whole idea. It is, I mean, the way we do it, we take the RGB image, compute to gray, just to make it less computationally, I mean, easy for computation. Then we do the Gaussian smoothing, which is uh, blurring the image, and uh, blurring helps because then sometimes we have high intensity pixels, which we can uh, flatten it. In that way, we get much more smooth edge. And then we use the scanning edge and we get the strong edges in the image. <coughs> but now we are getting a lot of clutter as well because uh, our interest kind of is mostly the uh, lane lines, but we are getting all other edges as well, which we can mask as a one way because we just mask and mask the area of interest by which we can declutter this whole image space. But uh, And the second tactic is really, really important, which is a half transform. And I really had a hard time to understand this because uh, the whole idea is uh, we have a line in a Cartesian space. And uh, if you look, we get this Kenny edge. And, uh, but we still don't know if it is a line or something else. It could be a curve, it could be anything, and uh, which is a bit difficult. So what the Huff transform does, it converts uh, things from Cartesian to parameter space. For example, if you have a line y equal to mx plus b, and where we have m and b the parameters like slope and the y-intercept, uh, so if you take the whole line in the Cartesian space, it has a it has a slope or uh, y-intercept that will become point in half space. So there's a line over here that becomes a point which you see on the on the right side graph, uh, because for a given line in the Cartesian space we have a defined slope and the y-intercept. But things change if we have a point in the Cartesian <coughs> space, it becomes line in the half space. Because from a point in the Cartesian space, there could be so many lines, which can have so many different parameters, m and v. And that's what is very interesting, because that helps us to extract shapes. Because we do have half transform for different, different things if we want to find edges, we want to find circles, we want to find ellipse, we use the tough transform. And uh, so in an edge detected image, for every point that is non-black, you draw lines in the parameter space because we have points uh, in this edge detected image. If you draw the same points in the half space, you will find a, you get a line. And all those lines will intersect. And uh, that will define the parameter of that line. And then we can do the line fitting passing through those points and that will give us a smooth line. And this is a little tricky and and, and if, if you get this, it really helps uh, to do a lot of feature extraction. And not only the line, if you're doing something else, trying to find circles like eyes and all those feature extraction, this is the technique, basic technique which is used. But here's the problem. The problem is, is if, we, if I have a vertical line, and that means my slope will be infinity. And, and then I cannot store it. I mean, it, I need like infinite memory to store that slope. So this kind of it doesn't work in that way. Then we have to think a little differently. We can use different parameterization, which is using the polar coordinate, where rho equal to x1 cos theta plus y1 sine theta, we represent the uh, line in a polar coordinate we have rho is the perpendicular distance from the origin, theta slope from the horizontal. Idea is same, uh, the line in polar coordinate becomes a point in the parameter space. But if you have a point on the left side, in the polar coordinate, it becomes a sinusoidal curve. Because for a point on the left side, you can have different lines, which can have different rho and theta theta can go from minus 90 to plus 90, and that will become a sinusoidal curve. And, and this helps us because if we use this way of transforming, then we, we don't have to worry about 
vertical lines and uh, so and, and that's what we have tried to do so the these are the points are each pixel yeah these are these are the kind of the spots so these are like edges uh, in in the kenyas detection so after we do the kenyas detection we get all those edges and for each as we get those points on and put hub down so so we get the line because what we are interested in the lines we not just interested like in the curves or circles or anything else because while we are getting the edge we are getting all kinds of edges and and my interest is not for all those edges my interest is only for the all of the lines and uh, I mean it's not that complex because the way things work uh, the east pixel has to vote uh, and and uh, so we have so many pixels on the on the edge and each pixel has to vote and then since from each point there could be so many different sinusoidal curves they intersect and you get those bright spots and after that you can do the curve fitting because now you you have the point which you can connect and and make a line you can ask me questions because this is really really important and after that thing just flow uh, and we just build a pipeline and then kind of a to kenyas half transform then we first sort of polynomial fit and because it's just y equal to mx plus b straight line we don't need second order first order is good enough for us and uh, after that we build the whole pipeline from the scratch we we use the uh, image after that we do the uh, grayscale then do the kenny <clears throat> Half transform, then do the polynomial fit, and then be kind of a superimpose on our original image. So this is we have done. So we did for one image, but now I can pass the whole video through this pipeline uh, because in the end, I video is like number of images, and when I kind of do that, and that's what you get. So just uh, you you are able to find those lane, and you can remain there. But this is a very very ideal scenario. Everything is straight, the lights are perfect. There's no weather changes, and and things looks okay. Yeah, yeah, fine. <coughs> looks like so simple. But uh, things changes now. I have like curves, and uh, the whole pipeline falls apart. Uh, it just doesn't work, and uh, that means I have to do something else. So little variation. Pipeline falls apart, so we tweak things again, and we have to understand some more basics. So first is the distortion, uh, because it, now we use camera which are having lenses, not like pinhole case camera. So because of the lenses, the light bends at the edges, and objects appear more or less curved than they actually are, which is a radial distortion, which is very very prevalent in all the cameras. But of course, if you have a good camera. They do all the processing before you take out the image. Uh, but uh, for example, my Pi camera is not that good; it has a lot of distortion, so I need to correct for it. Then we have a tangential distortion when we take image when the planes are not kind of a horizontal. So when I'm having my camera, I can take the image like this. I can take the image like this. So I'm not aligned to the horizontal plane. In that case, I get tangential distortion. But the second one could be discarded because. Uh, in most of the cases our camera is fixed kind of a labeled correctly it's not like we are holding the camera in our hand and moving it around it is fixed on the vehicle so we can pretty much discard the tangential but for radial still we have to do something and uh, for uh, so of course we have to do some calibration and this is pretty simple for any any camera i take standard image Uh, it's good to take checkerboard image because I I I have the clear edges, and uh, I take the image. Then there are like standard functions as part of OpenCV, and you can it can correct for distortions. So take image of known shapes, finding corners, use correction coefficient and undistort, and 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 it is like there are standard functions are there, so you don't have to really worry about. In the actual image, I don't see much difference because yeah. It is not like you can distinguish by your eyes, but here, of course, you have very distorted image, and and uh, if you pass through the filter, it just undistorted. 
and then second is the perspective transform which is also very very important because if we don't do this because lines lanes are not always straight up of course we do have a curve and and we cannot measure curve like it is much easier to measure curve if it taken from the bird's eye view if i'm taking from the top view i can easily find the curve i can do the curve fitting and i know the value of my curvature so that is important so that's why i have to do the perspective transform uh, to get the curvature right and the way we do it we define the four points which we want to flatten and define the source and destination four points and then we just takes them and flattens it and we do have a standard function in open cv which helps you to do the transformation and there could be different different perspective transformation it's not like we have to do bird's eye view but but again sometimes we have a three camera central camera left and right and that time also we have to do transformation and uh, now we are trying to build another another pipeline uh, since line, lanes are not always straight but again in in case of self driving car uh, based on the curvature we have to calculate the steering angle uh, angle to turn left or right and uh, we can really calculate this angle if you know the speed or throttle uh and dynamics of the car uh, but most important is the curvature because once we have that then it's much much easier so let's detect the lane lines we 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 can be made some like uh, we had some idea in the past we use kenny as hub transform to find the lane lines but that is not good enough the reason is we are using rgb color space and rgb color space have its own problem uh because of the shadow if you look at so there are different color spaces which we can use but let's talk about first the gradient so the gradient is like uh, we did the kenny edge to find the edges and uh, but it gives me everything it gives me all the edges and my interest is not to have all the edges i mean my interest is only the lane lines which is vertical pretty much vertical if you look those lines they are almost vertical of course they have a perspective but they are almost vertical that's my interest is i i don't really want to know all of the edges which are there in the in the image so for that i can take the gradient and then we have sobel operator which is which works like they are matrix manipulation is element wise matrix multiplication which gives us the gradient in the x and y direction so we have a operator for that and if i use that for example if i use sobel x it gives me the vertical line that's it and that's that's my interest is and if i use of course the sobel by then i get the mostly uh, y y gradient in the y y direction so this sometimes more effective than use a kenny edge it gives me the edges which i am interested without doing the cropping and uh, all of the post processing and then of course there are other ways once we one is like taking the magnitude of both sx and xy so by kind of square sum square root of the sum of squares uh, again we can build the other pipeline we convert to grayscale uh, here is a because that helps in computation then we calculate the derivative in xx direction which is 0 to 1 and again the value will lies between 0 to 1 then we can take derivative in the y to y by direction then we can take overall magnitude but then we have to convert back to the 8 bit image because our pixel intensity is like 0 to 255 so we multiply back to 255 to get the intensities back so i can get the binary activation so i can get black and white pixels which which helps so that's the reason we have to push it back and this is little weird because of course the image looks very cluttered and uh, here we are looking at the direction uh because what happens is like we can take the tangent of all those curves when we take tangent uh, the reason is like uh, we are looking we are interested like uh, all those lines in a specific orientation and though it looks very cluttered but i know what i am interested and that really helps like uh, because the, all those orientation when i take the inverse inverse kind of a inverse tangent of those gradient i can find the lines which are of specific orientation which i can extract and and use it for building my final pipeline and then all put together and i i get a much more cleaner you can see 
I, I didn't do any masking without masking. Also, I got my edges pretty decent. And though it was much complicated image, having a lot of shadows and cars and other stuff. And after that, uh, once we are done, then we have to look at the color thresholding. Thresholding is like, again, we define a threshold, uh, which is a technique to the binary activation. Anything which is more than the threshold, we make it one. Lower than threshold, we make it zero. So we get a very clear uh, image. We look at the RGB, which is good. That's what we are used to. Uh, but they are, there's a problem because if I convert RGB to gray to save some computation, the yellow becomes white. And even I, I need to know about yellow lane as well. Then of course we do the binary activation and then we get uh, kind of a white white lanes. But there are some other color spaces as well, which is uh, HSV and HSL, which is uh, hue, saturation, and blending. And both are same, just different way of saying it. So he was like, something doesn't change. If it is a red color, it will always be red. It will never change. Of course, you can add black and white pix black and white pixels. It will become light red or dark red. So you will have a different value. But the hue will still always be red. So it will always be same. So it will not change. And that, that kind of really helps that way of looking into a maze. And saturation is again, if they are pure color, then high in saturation. If you add more white, then they are low in saturation. So we can use different color space uh, because you have seen like in the past, we tried to, we build a pipeline, we kind of a little bit complex scenario where we had a lot of shades. This pipeline didn't work the way we intend it to work. So this could help. So let us see like uh, how things look if we use a uh, color thresholding. So we have uh, so we have RGB image. We can divide in different channels like R, G, and B. And uh, and uh, let's see the R. If you do the binary activation on R, this is the, this is what we this is what we get. Same thing we could try with HS, HL, HLS or HSL, how you say it. Uh, and then if I convert the same image into H, L, or S, just take only those channels and uh, put it over here. And if you look at the S channel. I mean, things are like pretty decent. Things are looking much, much clearer. And uh, so I can take the S channel and I can do the again binary activation where I can put some threshold, anything above the threshold, make it one, lower than the threshold, make it zero, just to be, just so we can highlight those features which we are interested. And uh, this is more like kind of a, if I try all those channels are as such, which one you feel may be the right pick. So, so now we have, uh, you can see there's a, we have a, uh, it's kind of bright spot because of the way the road kind of is painted or probably the build. Uh, and, and that is causing a lot of disturbance. And when we pass same to gray and then we pass same to S, H, channel, we get like, if, if you look at like, the S channel, things are decent on its own. I mean, I don't have to do much. I mean, if you look at the S channel, and I'm still getting pretty decent understanding of the lane without doing extra manipulation. And when I do the binary, then it is much more clear. And then, of course, now we can combine everything together, uh, all the color and, and the magnitude gradient. And then once we pass everything, this is what we get uh, on the right side, bottom right, that's the final image. There are a few more things, uh, because once we uh, do the color and gradient threshold, second is the perspective transform, because in the end we need to get the curvature. Until we don't get the curvature, it's very difficult. Our car doesn't know when to take turn, how much steering angle is required, and then we we of course learn the perspective, same thing we do on this image, on the binary image, and then we will of course do the curve fitting later, but that's, that's the step. So this is part of the curve fitting because uh, now we have to calculate the curve, but first we need to know the left and right lane. And uh, that's again much easier because we do the histogram, we, our interest is just the bottom half. We look at the bottom half of the image, we look at the kind of intensity change, pixel intensity change, and we know this is the left and right line, which is much easier. And 
after doing that, we can make a sliding window, which we can pass it on and try to work back and get the polynomial, mm -hmm. second degree polynomial, because it is a curvature now, there's no more straight line. And, uh, and now we can look at everything together. This is more advanced pipeline. Uh, let's put all together the undisturbed camera maze, apply a spectral transform to get a bird's eye view of the street, as, and then convert to HSV color space and apply color mask to identify yellow lens, then uh, apply sobo, then of course, uh, finally masking, then we create this uh, moving average filter to get the curvature, <coughs> and then we do the polynomial regression, get the equation of the curvature. Once we have the equation of the curvature, we don't need to anymore slide the window and uh, then we can just build this pipeline and pass it to the video. And, and that's what we do. Uh, things are not that perfect. I know, especially the radius is too off. It cannot be so high, 1.5 kilometer. This is very, very bad. So of course I need to kind of a, uh, tweak it. It doesn't look that off, but uh, the values are pretty off. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. but even though you can see Things are quite curvy and <coughs> somehow my power plan is still not that bad. It is still able to, able to follow uh, Aline. But now we have a bit different video. Uh, start playing. Let's see. Uh, okay. So th this is, now we have a lot of shades and sudden change of brightness and, uh, and the power plan doesn't work. I mean, I, no matter how many times I tweak it, it just it just falls apart, and uh, probably uh, I can further tweak all the parameters, and uh, but it just 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 fails, and that's the whole point because now it's like can there be some other ways? Of course I can keep on tweaking the parameters, keep on using uh, advanced algorithm to get things right, because all these are like. We defined all those features. We want to find the lane. And there are times there's no, I mean, lines are not there. I mean, because of any reason, we have uh, snow. There was any, any, any things which can really uh, kind of uh, impede us to find the lane. And then we use deep learning again. It's, it's a different way of looking at all the things. Of course, so far we try to use pure computer vision. But in deep learning, is we don't have to kind of a uh, because how do we know? How, I mean, how as a human we learn? We, we practice and, and then of course we gather this muscles memory over the time and, and just things go. So if I have to do the same thing and using a different pipeline, using some other different approach, one could be a deep learning approach. In which way I'll just take my car, of course I will drive. I'll drive to those, those places uh, and train it and I will drive it in the night. I will drive in different, different, different weather conditions, different lighting conditions, and drive and drive and collect more and more and more data. Once I, once I have a lot of data, I will build a neural network and build my model. And of course, we'll talk about those things, but, and then, and somehow like, of course you don't know what is going inside the neural network. Uh, if it is like uh, a really deep network, it's very difficult to visualize because it is more math than really able to see at each layer what's happening. But for example, if I have three layers of my neural network, the first layer I will get, it will automatically extract the features for me. In the first layer it will extract just the simple lines, curves. Second layer, it will try to put together those lines. And the third layer, I can get the perfect lines. And the reason, the way it works, because uh, because what happens is like when we're driving, we are giving it a steering because we are, we are driving the car, we are giving it an angle and, and all the data is more like supervised learning where we are passing all the data to the channel and uh, we're giving all the steering angle. So once we build that model and we pass that model to the car and let the car drive autonomously on its own, it, it has all the data. It knows in this weather condition, this was a steering angle, this was a throttle, in this condition, this was an angle. So all that learning is there, which helps it to drive. But of course, there could be a lot of edge cases. So that's where we never use one technique on its own. We have to combine all together. So let's talk, we will touch upon deep learning. Uh, we'll not go too much into math, at least not today. 
for some other time. Uh, but again, deep learning is kind of a part of machine learning where we use all logistic regression and where we do not hard code what we need. Uh, for example, like uh, uh, if I have, if I, for example, if you have to change like temperature from Celsius to Fahrenheit, you have a formula for that. We can build a function uh, using normal technique and then we can pass the value in Fahrenheit, we'll get the value in degree. But if we have to use machine learning or deep learning way of doing things, I have data. I have data of temperature when it is in Fahrenheit is this value and when it is in Celsius is this value. I pass all of data to my neural network. And after looking at all the data, it figures out this could be the right equation to calculate. So it is more like empirical. So when I pass like x1 by 1, x2 by 2, x3 by 3, x1 is like value in Fahrenheit, y1 is value in Celsius, and it figures out what could be the right formula to calculate. That's more like a machine learning way of calculating. So we don't hard code, we pass the data, and it just calculates what is the right, right, right way of calculating. Of course, there are techniques, back propagation, which kind of a uh, talk. I don't know how much we have time. Uh, and uh, so, so far you have looked like we have dependency upon human designated features. So all those features be defined, and we are using kind of a computer vision to find the features which we have defined. And uh, can we go away with it? And, and this way we use uh, CNN, which is a convolutional neural network technique, uh, where we learn the entire processing pipeline, data to steer an automobile. And, and that's what we have been a donkey car, because when I take this car around, I have a track. And I drive this car using joystick on that track, collect all the data, I pass it to the neural network, I build the model, then I let the car drive autonomously. So, I mean, that's the way kind of a, I trained this car in the beginning. Uh, and train grid is like, of course, all the images. So images are like, they have a associated JSON, JSON text file as well, because uh, not only the image, I am storing the steering angle, I'm storing the throttle, both I'm storing at the same time. So I know this image is having this steering and this throttle. So if I have to train this car, and uh, I mean, again, there, there, there are two ways to fail. I mean, once I build the, once I collect the data, one way to fail is like, uh, my network is not good enough, it's not robust. The neural network which I built is not good enough. Second, I'm a lousy driver, I don't know how to drive, and I'm doing mistakes. The whole point is here, like, if I do mistakes, for example, if I go out of the lane, I can come back. And, and the network remembers that also. So it is like correction on its own. Because when I'm making mistakes, I'm correcting my mistakes. And even I'm feeding those mistakes as well. So it try to learn all those scenarios. So whenever it is off the track, it knows if it goes off the track, it has to come back. But of course, you, you need to do that to beat it. And that's like pretty, pretty fascinating to me. Uh, we can teach anything we want. I mean, especially with deep learning. The way we learn music, the way we learn to paint, to write, we can just pass that data and, and it will figure out <coughs> how you write, how you learn to speak. And, and that's the way we try in this case of uh, autonomous driving. Of course, there are a lot of nitty gritties uh, in this, this approach. Uh, for example, uh, for, for example, when I kind of collect the data, I go clockwise, then I go counterclockwise, and I flip the images, then I can train it because uh, they are, because I, I want to generalize my, my curvature as much as I can. So I go in one direction, let's train it in the other direction, that's kind of flip the images and again train it. That way I can build my model really, really robust. I was trying to do the same thing with those videos, but it was difficult because I didn't have enough data to process because I had just five, 10 minutes video, limited number of images, and uh, no matter how much I try, to flip the images and train it, still it wasn't robust enough. I need to have more data to train the same videos just to see whether my pipeline is better if I use the deep learning or stick with the CV, CV way of doing things. There are different architecture. Uh, Linet is the one architecture. And uh, I mean, of course, there's a Google Net, Google Linet, they say AlexNet, different, different architectures which have different level of accuracy. Uh, 
So, and of course, the simulation and road testing, uh, I can, and both the things like I can, of course, uh, drive my car in the simulator mm -hmm. and test my car on the simulator just to see how well it learned. And of course, I can kind of uh, try it in the, in the, the real world. Uh, the whole point is uh, I'm, I'm driving my car, collecting all the data, passing it to, I can see it as a black box at this time, but probably uh, later we can talk about more in detail because we have to start again, the way we started on the pixel, we have to start it, we need to start with perceptron. That's the, that's the first thing. We have to build the neural network. And that itself is like, kind of a we understand the perceptron, how we do the feature extraction, and uh, how do we do the back propagation, how do we do the loss correction, so which itself is a kind of big topic. Probably we can talk about it in the uh, in the future. But uh, other thing is which we can talk about setting up the environment because this was very tricky for me, uh, and a lot of times uh, I sort of quit because uh, it's very difficult to have the CV working on my especially the window PC. So of course you can use the either the cloud platform, but they are very expensive. I had like $200 credit, which I used in kind of a, within, a, within a month actually. Uh, so the Google Collab is really a good thing. So let's talk about it. Good part is uh, it's like free and uh, to get the free GPU. This is, I mean, the whole point is, uh, if I don't know how many of you use the Jupyter Notebook. So this is like a Jupyter Notebook, the same as Jupyter Notebook, where you can code and run at the same time. And it, it helps because things are a little bit more organized. But but in this case, let me kind of connect with the, because in, in the end I need uh, GPU. Because if I use only CPU, it's very difficult to train the model because it just takes forever. CPU is like where we do the central processing unit like is fast in calculation, but it can't do multiple processing at the same time. So we need graphical processing in our GPU, and uh, either you buy your own GPU or you use the cloud instance. But with the Collab, uh, things are much easier because you already have a GPU inbuilt as part of the instance, and it, and it is pretty much free. You don't have to pay for it, and uh, it already is having all the tool chain in place. It has the uh, CV, TensorFlow, Keras, all those models already there. But in the end, you need get us to build your neural network, otherwise it's, it becomes very, very complex. Uh, and first, just to kind of a mount a drive. I use my kind of a college credentials because it, it gives me unlimited space. But otherwise, you're restricted to 15 GB, whatever Google gives you and that is not enough, sometimes we have a lot of data. So I can mount a drive, I can define, uh, I can of course need to get to the right place. And which uh, this is there, let's see. So this, I mean, this is the kind of whole pipeline which I, I was showing, showing it to you is all kind of a built, I mean, this is mostly, everything is Python and nothing else. But uh, the whole point is to show this is, uh, I mean, this is much easier because setting an environment was kind of a challenge for me. It just took me a lot of time to get things in place. And once I had this call app, it really kind of made things much easier because I can run it while I'm doing something else. I can just leave it running and I, I can do it from any, any different laptop. So this this kind of a really really helped, yeah. Probably, but next time we can talk more about the perceptron and then 
about the neural network if you're interested. Uh, I mean, how the how the network how the neural network works. How can you build on your own? And it is super fun, and you can generalize really. I mean, you can generalize it really, really well. Yeah. So yeah, thanks for listening to me. Let me know if you have any question. I thought this will take more time because I had 50 slides, but it I was too quick. It was fine. Yeah. So this is a model car. I thought I will kind of. I just need to connect with the Wi-Fi, then anybody can drive, and uh, yeah. Okay, to play with it. Probably I'll just try to fix it. Try to connect <laughs> with the Wi-Fi and then put it on the put there outside if somebody's interested to drive it. Yeah, I, I was thinking to form a kind of deep learning group here if people are interested. It's more like uh, outside the work we can meet and talk. It is a very interesting field. It's really fascinating, at least to me. But but yeah, just let me know if somebody's interested. Yeah. Any, yes. When you have a new course, how long would it take to train? I just did it, yeah. So, so it's like if I if I we draw a new course, then at least I need like uh, 20, 15, 20 good laps. If I have 15 or 20 good laps, then that's good enough. It it works, yeah. But then I need to maintain the same writing conditions. If you change the writing conditions, then it again creates problem. But then I have to train in all different conditions. I have to train in different writing conditions. If the people are moving, all those scenarios I have to take into account. And then only I have to build this behavioral cloning model. Otherwise, yeah, slight changes, it just creates problem. Right. Two full questions. So um, the content of the brain of the, you know, the neural network, is that being copied? Can that be copied to over? Or is this every brain have to learn themselves? So you can, you, yeah, you if can. I want to sell a car, do I train that and then when I buy a car, it already comes pre-learned. Yeah, it, it comes. So what happens is like even today, uh, we have some raw data set. Of course, we have restriction. We cannot collect too much of data. So we use the data set which are already there. And so we have this pre-trained model. And we can use the pre-trained model. But again, there are some restrictions how you can use that. Because yeah. if you have a pre-trained model, and uh, and if the new, I mean, if the, for example, you're doing image, image classification. And you have images of like ImageNet. You have all the images of like fruits. And now you are trying to learn something in the same similar field, but you have a new data set which is much lower. In that case, you can use a pre-trained model and then use it for this scenario okay. because you have some similarities. But if you are trying to use it for all different kind of images, which is there's no connection, then then it, I mean, difficult. And, and, and what's in our cars today? What is that? Is that? In the cars today, that neural network, or how does it work? I mean, Vimo, of course, they do. Uh, so something called the reinforcement learning. So that's what is used nowadays, okay. where you are learning on the go. So of course, it is going on the course, but of course, you have some past data, okay. and uh, and it is learning on the go. So the reinforcement learning is kind of a, that's what is used today in the Google. But if you look at Tesla and all, they use mostly like a, they also use the same. Deep learning approach for automation. Yeah. Can the real car be using on GPS coordinates as well, right? Can't say it again. Can the real car be using GPS coordinates as well, just to to localize like a double check? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So in the real car, like we have sensor fusion, we use radar, uh, which is radio detection and ranging. We use lidar, and we have a lot of the sensors which gives us the uh, data like from LiDAR, of course, we can get the depth, mm -hmm. and we have much more clarity in terms of all the edges. Even in the night vision, it, it works pretty fine. So in the real car, of course, we use all the sensor fusion along with the deep learning, uh, deep learning approach, and that that gives. Uh, but again, even for the real car, also we have to train it. That's the reason all those cars are like driving from so many million miles, just to, yeah, just to have a much more robust model. What are some of the biggest bottlenecks or challenges for this research area right now? I mean, data is kind of a data is always always a problem because we just feel like, especially anybody who's in deep learning, more data is better. And uh, but uh, if you look like on the accuracy side, it's still be like almost 95, 96 percent, which is pretty good. But when we talk about driving, one mistake can kill someone, and if human does mistake, it's fine. But if machine does mistake, it becomes a big deal. So, and 
So that's that's one thing. And uh, can we work with the less data? That's the research is now focused. Really, do we need always so much of data to learn and to be to a point where we can deploy? The best part which I like about this behavioral cloning is I don't need all the sensors. I just need <coughs> camera. One camera, if I have a defined space, for example, I am making a postal delivery within a campus. I have a defined lane. I can mark the lanes in a way which is good for my camera. And then it can do a pretty well job just with a one camera. So, so not always looking like something very complicated where things can take care of all the edge cases, but things which is less severe. I mean, even the mistake happens is fine. But then you have much more cost-effective way of automating, and that's where kind of I personally very interested because, I mean, there are cases where we don't need to be always right. It's fine to be wrong at some time because it will not kill someone. In those cases, it's a pretty decent cost-effective approach for automation. How does the neural network fit on the error that's trying to is that just based upon how the vehicle is driven during this training session? Mostly, like, so the, the way we do is like, for example, we have a data set. So, of course, we divide the data set into three different parts. One is the training, one is the validation, and one is, of course, testing. So, in the training, you know the error, you know the loss function. So, we have a loss function by which we calculate the error. And we have something called back propagation. So, we kind of a feed back that error again. And we know, we know how much it is improving. So while well, at training time, but those are like labeled images if we are doing image classification. So every time the network is learning, so we have apex. So like we have one full apex, then we have second apex, and every time we know how how well we are learning because those images are labeled. This is supervised learning after all. So as part of the learning, it knows the error because all the images are labeled. Means for example, in case of uh, driving, we have uh, steering and the throttle value. So I know a steering has to be this much or within this range when it is over there. And if it is not there, that means I have error. And, and, and that's the way sort of a, it is correcting those errors. It's part of the training. Once it is trained, then we have validation. Even those images are labeled actually. And it is seeing it first time. So my model is seeing it first time. And then I pass those images to the model. Uh, I know how much, where I am hitting, uh, where I am. So that kind of a helps for Kind of a network to correct itself, and and the whole point is like you don't define all those edge cases. It just it does it. It's not like I have to define different lighting conditions, all those. Just I have to train. I need to have the data in those scenarios. That's it. If I have the right data, it knows what to do. Does the magnitude of the like the amount of data matters? Let's say out of thousand data points, you have a tricky situation only one time in your data set. Does that, does that then, uh, how to say, based on other data points, not be important to this particular data point? Again, so so for what happens is like, uh, that's where comes the reward function. So for those points, we define very high reward. So that means those are very, very important. So, so that's where we can define importance to those points. And that way, it can take special attention to those points. So, so we define the reward, and then that, that helps. To come out of those tricky situations. So, so reward function is another thing which we need to be very, very specific how do we define it. Uh, philosophically, do you think the roads must be digitalized more in the future? I mean that that will happen because once the I mean there will be a different standard of uh, kind of a painting the road and kind of a paint to use and which could be easily recognized by different kind of sensors. So once we talk about full automation, but again, I think uh, today is like technology is trying to adjust with what is there. But at some point, even the infrastructure, infrastructure has to change based on the technology. So so that, that, that will happen at some point. So I will. So all the data computation takes a lot of time. So where does it all happen? This specific control. For for me, it's like I do all oh, cloud. I does on the I do everything on the cloud. But but uh, but in the end, I mean, you need a GPU. That's for sure. You can't use your laptop. For, it just will keep for forever. <coughs> train simple mode. If I train 
this uh, 15 minutes of driving from this car it just takes hours and hours. But if I use the collab, then it is much faster. It's almost like eight, nine times faster. is if one entity is good enough to learn such a model if we're talking about real cars, um, does it make more sense to uh, have a lot of vehicles learn one model together and then if there are all vehicles that are driving to an hour for example, giving the data then you just don't need this uh, these complex models either because just like there were so many vehicles driving ahead and there are just very few situations that you can need to recover. That's what I'm saying. I'm trying to visualize but uh, not, not very clear because it's like the models once for example once I learn in this car of course it has a different dynamics but if I have a similar car the same dynamics I can pass that model to that car and that will also work pretty fine. I mean it could be, it is kind of a transferable as well if we have the same similar dynamics. But what you are suggesting is like having a standard model for, I just couldn't follow. Well, well, if you learn with this model, you have to drive a couple of it, yeah. iterations around the, the, your, your course to, to learn it. If uh, somebody drives from A to B yeah. and there are 1,000 other vehicles that drive from A to B, mm -hmm. then that is all together, the best model that's possible. So it can extract all, all that, which all, is... All that could, could they pass yeah. down their learnings to the next one coming to that road? Yeah, basically, basically, right? basically, basically. Yeah. and then it's just what you do when you yeah. drive, when you're tired, you just follow the guy in front of you. Says, actually, he knows that. That's, that's what you're imagining. If my car doesn't know, the car which is running in front of me may be knowing the right thing. So better follow up. I mean, I don't know, but something called, again, the reinforcement learning where you have a basic model, uh, which you have trained. Now you have a new course, new new circuit. And then, but then it's a reinforcement learning. So you are like kind of pushing the learning. And in that case, it can adapt. So you don't, even though you didn't kind of teach on that course, it has a learning from the past. So, so that kind of a pretty matured field now. But now kind of sharing the same model, I don't know really. If that is possible. Uh, it I could be. Uh, on the simpler, on the similar lines, like, uh, for example, to learn one lap, I mean, to learn for one course, you say like <coughs> 20, 20, uh, 10 to 20 laps, yeah. for example. Like, uh, for example, uh, if you're going from A to B on a same car, say C class, like, okay, yeah. C class. From here to Ann Arbor, it will be 100 laps or 100 drives to learn. Uh, what if you use a 50 cars? 50 C class, mm -hmm. driving from A to B, uh, collecting the same amount of data but with different drivers and different yeah, ways. Yeah. Does, can that be combined? Yeah, that's what happens now. So for example, if you look at like YMO, they are like driving almost for 10 years. They have like gathered 20, 30 miles, million miles. But you look at Tesla, I mean, Tesla is every car is having autopilot, which is kind of a pretty much turned on. And they have gathered 1 billion miles. And they just don't even exist for like a couple of years. Uh, and that's what they're trying. They're cracking all the data and, and fusing it together to build the better autopilot. So so that 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 is you don't have to drive the same car of course. You can fuse it together. Yeah but I think the data exchange component comes is important because you you don't want to overtrain the model because if one if yes, one car would have driven all over the world and with green stripes and yellow stripes and white stripes and green trees and brown trees, at the end of the day, it's so confused that it doesn't know anymore. You know, but the, the, I, I've heard that neural neural networks can know themselves when not to overlearn. Yeah, so that's they could swap out the data, and like like the Google Maps uh, tiles all over the world, and you would know. All right, in this area, I should use this set of data in this area. So, so they call it like overfitting, which is like again always need to be avoided because overfitting makes kind of a model too complex and and time it is stuck it just doesn't know where to go because so overfitting is so there are like techniques called inception techniques the different techniques which uh, kind of uh, helps not to overfit the model and which is again part of the part of the building the model you sort of take care of it yeah. so overfitting doesn't happen 
In the future, is there like scope where, say, there are two cars that are traveling together, will they communicate with each other? That's certainly fairly possible. I mean, even now, like over the cloud, the way you can. Are they, but these sort of things, I guess, with AI, a lot of stuff would be like legalized or legislations will have to be. Yeah, yeah, I believe so. But the reason is like uh, uh, the way we drive the car as a, as a human, it's always dependent on the way the person in front of also is driving because there's a dependency. It's not like we can go with our own speed, but that do can determine, determine like how we should drive, be driving. So, I mean, that's that probably would be. I like guess that comes back to car thing yeah. question where you know, if you have 50 cars doing the same thing, then this, they are all fast drivers. Yeah. I, so. All right, um, thank you very much, yes. Sameet. If any of you are uh, interested in this topic, we can discuss with Sameet offline. And plus, yeah. we have a demo, right? Yeah, I have to kind of say, I need to configure the Wi-Fi.